In this lecture, I plan to describe the discovery of the century, everyone's favorite, the finding by British archaeologist Howard Carter in 1922 of the intact tomb of King Tutankhamun, the boy king of Amarna. This discovery set off a worldwide mania for the fabulous boy king, which still pretty much continues unabated in the world of today. This was the first royal tomb to be discovered that had not been pillaged of its treasures in antiquity. Although, interestingly enough, robbers had actually broken into it twice in ancient times. But apparently little, if anything, had been stolen. Just an interesting side note, though. It is a little-known fact that another royal tomb was discovered elsewhere in Egypt, also filled with fabulous treasure that had also escaped the ancient tomb robbers. But it wasn't on the scale of this one. And unfortunately, the discovery of that one was overshadowed by the outbreak of World War II, so failed to come to anyone's attention. So let's grab our shovels, don our pith helmets and sunblock, and see what we can scratch out of the dirt of the Valley of the Kings. All right, I want to complete our study of the Amarna period by taking a closer look at King Tut's tomb. Obviously, everyone has heard of King Tut's tomb and the fabulous treasures that had been found within it. But I wanted to take a little bit closer look at some of the circumstances surrounding its discovery and some of the uh, issues associated with the tomb itself. So just to review a little bit, to recall to mind that some of the facts that we talked about last time. And that is Tutankhamun dies unexpectedly at the age of 19. And as we've referred to, his burial was somewhat hasty. Now, of course, it had to take place within a 70-day period for the mummification. But the, the question kind of revolves around the issue of how do you assemble all those fabulous grave goods and beautiful statues and coffins and so on within a 70-day period. Now, as we know, as we talked about, his royal tomb in the Western Valley, at the southern end of the Western Valley, was unfinished at the time of his death, of course, because he dies unexpectedly. And so, as a consequence, I has him buried in a small borrowed tomb on the floor of the Valley of the Kings. And we think that perhaps it could have been Ai's own tomb, but not necessarily. So flying down here to see the location of it. We see the tomb entrance there on the floor of the valley instead of in the valley's walls, as was typical of any self-respecting pharaoh. Wouldn't have had his own tomb created on the floor of the valley, for goodness sake. So... This was a tomb that was obviously created for somebody else, and it had characteristics that were not typically associated with pharaonic tombs. So here's a closer view of the way that it looks today, as seen today, with a nicely designed entrance and so forth for tourists and so on, and right at the foot of another tomb that was created at a much later time. Now, after the burial had taken place and the tomb sealed up, then this entrance to the tomb was eventually covered over by debris from the building, from the construction of this tomb. And this tomb was the tomb of Ramses VI. And, of course, uh, his workers had no idea that there was a tomb in the floor of the valley here because... Why would there be a tomb in the floor of the valley? And so they had no idea that that tomb was there. And so as they excavated the tomb for Ramses VI, the debris and the detritus and so forth was simply dumped out in front of the tomb for convenience sake and covered over the entrance to King Tut's tomb. So those two things, the fact that the tomb was in the floor of the valley of the kings, instead of the walls where any self-respecting pharaoh's tombs would be, and the fact that it was covered over by a layer of debris helped to keep the tomb hidden for some 20 centuries. Fortunately for us, right? 
Now, if you recall back to our last lecture, the Pharaoh Horemheb had made a deliberate and concerted effort to erase the stain of the Akhenaten era from the annals of Egyptian history. So, all references to Tutankhamun had been erased along with everyone else from the royal household. So, for the most part, no one during the modern era even knew anything about Tutankhamun. He was an unknown pharaoh, with the exception of Harmheb's eradication program had missed one or two items that came to light in the 20th century. These are small items that uh, contain the name of Tutankhamun. But keep in mind that at this point, this was prior to 1920s, at this point no one knew anything of Tutankhamun. The name was not even known. The family was not known. Nefertiti was not known. None of these things had been discovered yet, right? And so it's hard, a little bit hard sometimes for us to remember that there was a time when he was not, right? Uh, and so it was fortunate, though, that a few little bits and pieces of artifacts had escaped that eradication program to emerge in the 20th century and inspire a search for this previously unknown pharaoh. In other words, the idea was is that for researchers was to try to find any royal tombs that they could that could be found in the valley or anywhere else really and so researchers had pretty much given up on the idea that there was anything left to be found prior to the discovery of king tut's tomb prominent researchers simply had washed their hands clean of it, finding anything else of, of promise or of note in the valley and simply said it had been wrung dry there was nothing else left but there were these few references to this unknown individual by the name of Tutankhamun. And so this inspired, in particular, a English archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter to, to search for this pharaoh in the hopes that perhaps there was yet a tomb that was undiscovered. So he was enlisted by a wealthy patron by the name of Lord Carnarvon, who had a great interest in archaeology and antiquities, and himself had tried for a year to go to Egypt and do some little archaeological work on his own, managed to turn up just a mummified cat, and so had uh, grown disenchanted with the whole process, and instead engaged Howard Carter as someone who had extensive knowledge of the Valley of the Kings, remember we talked about him in regards to the tomb of Queen Hatshepsut. He had been in charge of overseeing the valley for a number of years by the Egyptian government. And now Lord Carnarvon hires him to find this tomb, if there was such a thing. And again, they're just taking a stab in the dark. They have no idea that there is any such tomb anywhere in the valley or anywhere else, because they don't even know who Tutankhamun was as a pharaoh. There was no such pharaoh as Tutankhamun as far as they knew, other than these references to his name. So they embark on a grand campaign to try to find this tomb, if at all possible. So Carter searched for the tomb for eight to ten years not finding anything of value and of significance to encourage Carnarvon to keep funding the project. And finally, Carnarvon grew uh, disenchanted with it and decided to withdraw funding after eight or nine years of not being able to find anything. And so he informed Carter that he was going to terminate his, his support of the project and withdraw his funding. Carter managed to convince him to fund one more year of searches. And so in that year, November 1922, Carter's workers finally, at last, almost by accident, uncovered a stone step in the valley floor in that last year of excavations. Of course, this was cause for great hope. 
and Carter has his workers begin to excavate this site. So it led to a descending rubble-filled corridor. So removing the fill revealed a sealed door. Well, of course, this was cause for great excitement and great hope because the door was secured still with priestly seals. So Carter, in order to keep the place secure, refilled the passage and put guards on the site to make sure that no one would disturb it and then sent off a cable to his patron, Lord Carnarvon in England, informing him that a great discovery had been made. He exaggerates it a bit by saying in the cable, uh, a magnificent tomb has been discovered, when in reality the tomb had not yet been discovered. All that had been discovered was a door that was still sealed, but with the hopes that a tomb would be located beyond, of course. Of course, it may have just been a storage room for all he knew, but nevertheless, he sends this message to Lord Carnarvon. And it takes some three weeks for Carnarvon to arrive from England with his daughter to observe uh, the proceedings. So here is an image of Lord Carnarvon on the left with Carter on the right as they come to re-excavate the corridor. So the passage was once again cleared and a hole was bored into the sealed door. Now Carter says that he knocked a small hole into the door and held up a, into the upper left hand corner of the door and he held a candle to the hole just to test for any kind of noxious gases that might have been contained and sealed within the, within the uh, chamber beyond. You could see that there was a chamber beyond in the darkness there. And so after a moment, Lord Carnarvon, of course, not able to contain his excitement or his curiosity any longer, asked him if he could see anything. And Carter's response was, yes, wonderful things. So the light of the candle had flickered across objects that were hidden in the dark beyond. So he later says, gold everywhere, the glint of gold. So here's a little video that kind of captures that moment, even though we're looking at a flashlight here instead of a candle. Can you imagine the moment when Carter looks into that room and sees evidences of this burial chamber as yet intact after 10 years virtually of searching for it at last found the treasure load? So the door was then broken open to reveal what we call the, the antechamber beyond. So here you see in my reconstruction the configuration of the corridor and the antechamber. Now this antechamber was stuffed full of artifacts of burial goods and burial furniture, some of which you see here in this black and white photograph. So you see some beds and boxes and containers and baskets and disassembled chariots and chariot wheels, all kinds of artifacts in that first antechamber. It's, you, you also notice that things seem to be rather uh, scattered about here. And that's because later on, as I mentioned earlier, it was, it was learned that there were at least two separate break-ins by robbers in antiquity and the burial goods were scattered around, apparently, as they searched for, for loot and treasure that they could easily carry out with them. However, on both occasions, the break-in was prevented. The robbers were apprehended and taken away for trial. And then the, the room just left as it was, for the most part, and the door resealed. In any case, there are so many things in this chamber that it took some three months just to catalog everything that was in the chamber. And we see here a representation, a modern day recreation of the disposition of these items that were located in that chamber. And then also in an adjacent chamber, right underneath this bed here, there's a small low opening in the wall and that led to this so-called annex and that also was filled full of burial goods. But neither of these was the burial chamber. 
because no sarcophagus was found in either of them. Then, digging out a blocked doorway here uh, that was framed by two standing statues, sentry statues, Carter discovered what he called a solid wall of gold. So you see him here standing in the partially demolished doorway uh, with Lord Carnarvon and beyond what appears to be a partition of some kind. Now this proved to be the burial chamber, ultimately. So we see it here. And one of the things to note is that it is very small for a pharaonic tomb. Nothing on the scale of the tombs that we have seen so far. So this alone raises the question of whether this was prepared for him, was made for him, and the answer for that would apparently be no. It was, it was made for someone else and then was repurposed for him due to his unexpected death. Another indication that it was not made for him is that when we come down the corridor, what we have here is a right turn to the burial chamber. Now, for pharaohs, the turn from the corridor was always left, not right. So left, for the Egyptian, left, the left hand was the masculine hand, the right hand was the feminine hand, and so their tombs always made a left hand turn as you left the entrance corridor. This one obviously makes a right hand turn. So there has been some serious suggestions recently that this was a tomb that was created for a woman, not for a pharaoh. And that raises all kinds of questions as to who that woman may have been. But in any case, there's no answers for that, unfortunately, at this time. But we have a right hand turn and then a very small space, both of which would argue against this being a pharaonic tomb. So it's kind of a jerry-rigged tomb for a young pharaoh that dies unexpectedly. And perhaps at the instigation of I, who is going to, who has his sight set on, on Tutankhamun's own pharaonic tomb at the end of the Western Valley, not going to put him in there, not finished anyway, but in any case, he ends up here. Now, as we look at the painting here, I find it rather interesting in that it's fairly simple treatment of figure work compared to what we have seen in the past that, that seems to be far more complex and kind of busy with a with variety of uh, figures and hier hieroglyphics. Here we see some very simplistic and simple figures outlined in black uh, and in a way almost cartoonish looking to a certain degree. Now I find these figures to be somewhat more organic than usual and I would, uh, I would suggest that that is a, a carryover and influence from the artwork of the Amarna period where we saw those more interpretive and organic figures there. And so I think that one of the consequences of that Amarna period is that Egyptian figure work does start to become somewhat more organic, and I think we see that here in these figures, painted on this yellow background in a very simple and direct sort of manner. So this wasn't just a partition, a solid wall of gold that Carter encountered. But instead, it was and turned out to be a gilded wooden shrine that virtually filled the entire burial chamber. So here's that shrine as it is seen today in Cairo Museum. It is wooden covered with sheets of gold and then doors on the front secured with priestly knotting. Here's a photograph of Carter with his photographer as they clamber over the top of this shrine and you can see how very constricted the space is here as they investigate this shrine. Here's an example of the beautiful artwork in relief and in hieroglyphs that were executed on the sides of this, sh of this shrine. Exquisite uh, figure work, quite frankly. And then here we see Carter 
opening up the door there and looking into the interior, expecting to find a sarcophagus. But what he found instead was another shrine inside, like you see here. That too had doors on the short end of it here. He opens that up and finds another shrine inside of that. Opens that those doors up and finds another shrine <laughs> inside of that. And so there are four wooden shrines gilded, nested inside of one another here. Now he's got to dissemble all of this, and it's very fragile, so it takes a great deal of time, especially with all the congested space and difficult working conditions. It takes a great deal of time for them to dissemble it. It took, in fact, two years to dismantle these shrines and remove them from the tomb. But once he had done that, then at last he finds in the innermost shrine the sarcophagus of King Tut. A pink granite sarcophagus, as you can see here, bordered by the goddess Isis at the four corners. So also at that same time as they removed the shrines inside here, they found a doorway leading into another chamber, and that was dubbed the treasury. So that was also filled full of burial goods and artifacts and treasure that had to be very carefully cataloged and removed. So these three chambers contain over 5,000 pieces of burial, furniture, artifacts, weapons, statues, jars, all kinds of things, the full extent of which is only just now being completely cataloged and examined in Cairo because the Egyptians have just recently built the Grand Egyptian Museum and have, are moving all of King Tut's treasures into that new space and gives them much better research facilities to finally bring everything out that had been kept stored in boxes since 1922, bring everything out and begin to examine everything in detail and restore those things that need restoring. So at last, the entire treasure of King Tut's tomb is, is being examined and cataloged and very carefully researched today. Now, in the treasury were contained the canopic jars for the internal organs and the coffins for King Tut's young daughters. Now, once the sarcophagus lid was lifted and removed, uh, and by the way, they had to remove that entire wall where the doorway had been located. They had to take that entire wall down so that they could get these things out. But in any case, once the sarcophagus was opened, the coffin, of course, that was found inside had to be removed. And Carter reported that it seemed unexpectedly heavy and difficult to move. So here we see a modern-day recreation of the extraction of that coffin from the sarcophagus a method that he may have used. And here we see him investigating one of the coffins inside the tomb. Now the thing that uh, he discovered uh, as the reason for how heavy it was is because there were three coffins nested inside of each other. You know, like we've seen before with these nested coffins. So here is a photograph of that outer coffin, the one that you see here. Okay. This is the outer coffin as seen in the Cairo Museum. It is made of wood, but is gilded and beautifully inlaid and decorated with sheets of gold, lapis lazuli and carnelian for the red and blue colors, and just beautifully fashioned with a pharaoh lying in his death pose, right, with the arms crossed over the chest, as is typical of mummies of the pharaohs. Here you see the middle coffin that also was of gilded wood. This does not have the inlay that the outer one does, but beautifully designed nevertheless. And you see the men here lifting it out of the sarcophagus in the tomb, giving an idea of the scale. So here it is in the Cairo Museum. And again, just a magnificent work of art. 
As you look at these, the, the question always comes to mind is, how are they able to do all of this within 70 days? Because this sort of thing wouldn't have been begun when Tutankhamun began his reign, because you wouldn't have known how big to make it and stuff like that. And so you had to wait till he died before you could put all this stuff together, or at least until he was a mature man, before you could begin creating all this funerary furniture. And so it begs the question of how were they able, how were Egyptian artisans able to, to put all this beautiful artwork together in such a short period of time, just, just 70 days? And of course, it's the size it is because it had to hold another coffin inside of it. And that inner coffin, to the surprise of everyone, was solid gold. So here we see a photograph of it. Again, beautifully crafted and designed. And as you look at closer views of it, again, just continues to beg the question of how are they able to create this? magnificent artwork in such a brief period of time, apart from just the, the amount of gold that is being used here. So one of the questions is, is perhaps these kinds of things were created for someone else, and then maybe the face was fashioned at a later time in order to conform to, to the young pharaoh, whereas the rest of it perhaps had already been constructed. Again, those kinds of things are open to question and there's no definitive answers about it, unfortunately. But it just almost boggles the mind as you look at the beauty of the artwork that we have here. And then here is the mummy itself. It's in very bad condition and has been right from the time that the Carter first opened up the coffin. It was obviously very hastily prepared, and the chemicals that were used to, to mummify and preserve it actually virtually destroyed it in many ways. Some scholars today say that those chemicals had caused a spontaneous combustion within the coffin that badly scorched the body. So you can see here how very dark and black it is, almost as though it has been burned. Here's the head that shows you the same evidence. We're lucky today that any of this has survived over the centuries to allow for investigation. But again, part of the problems with trying to determine what it, what it was that killed the young man is hampered by the issue of, of the chemicals and the scorching. It, it makes it more difficult to conduct conclusive forensic studies on the body in order to find out definitively what it was that uh, caused his death. So, of course, today with more modern, up-to-date medical equipment, you're able to arrive at better conclusions. But to begin with, uh, there was really nothing that could be done in order to try to figure out what it was that caused this young man's death. And then... Everybody's favorite piece is the, the, the death mask. So covering the head of that mummy was this magnificent death mask. It also was made of solid gold. And you can see that famous image here that we see so often represented. And so here's the view that you always get of the death mask. But I like this side view. Also, because it, it does really show the fact that it was a young man that we have here, not an, an older pharaoh. And so I think that's kind of a, a nice indicator of, of the fact that he died as a relatively young man. Just one comment I wanted to make here about the pharaonic beard, and that is in the Cairo Museum years ago, museum authorities decided to touch up the, the mask and kind of clean it off and, and so on. And quite by accident, they knocked the beard completely off. <laughs> and so they didn't tell anybody about it until it finally showed up in later reports. But they hastily glued it back on, uh, hoping that no one would notice. So 
I'm sure today that they have reaffixed that beard so that it's no longer unstable. But uh, I also like this rear view. I think it's really very handsome design with the lapis lazuli and the gold ribs coming down off of the headdress and then into the into the pigtail here uh, with this beautiful repetition of form. It's a, it's a view that you, you never see, and yet I think it's a very handsome aspect of this figure as well. And then I want to finish this just with uh, a comment about some of the enigmas that perhaps have been solved that revolve around this very interesting and enigmatic family of Akhenaten. And so recent pathological studies have perhaps given us a little bit better understanding of some of the puzzling aspects of the family that I mentioned earlier, one of which, of course, is the elongated skull. Uh, you see this all the time, both in full round sculptures like this and in relief. And so is that elongated skull, is it a royal style, as I suggested earlier? Or is it a family trait? Well, here's a CT scan of King Tut's skull, and you can see what seems to me, at least, to be a rather elongated aspect to his skull. So maybe there is a bit of that. Of course, it's nowhere near as, as exaggerated as this, but maybe there is a bit of elongation to the heads of the family of Akhenaten and maybe suggested this interpretation. But then, of course, you've got the full figure here with its rather androgynous appearance that a combination of both male and female. One researcher has suggested that perhaps this androgynous appearance was deliberate again, not a consequence of a medical condition, a deliberate choice, perhaps to honor the Aten, who as creator of all life was both male and female, kind of a self-created deity. So maybe combining the two genders into one and then that being used to represent the Pharaoh, who of course is the representative of the God on earth. So possibly symbolic of that characteristic of the Aten. Again, speculation, but kind of an interesting thing to think about. And then here's a statement by Zahi Hawass, a former head of Egyptian antiquities, who always had very strong opinions to state and didn't hesitate to state them. So here, in a, following a pathological study of the family of Tutankhamun in 2010, this is his statement about these anomalies that, that show up in the artwork. He says, the particular artistic presentation of persons in the Amarna period is confirmed by pathological studies as a royally decreed style, most probably related to the religious reforms of Akhenaten. It is unlikely that either Tutankhamun or Akhenaten actually displayed a significantly bizarre or feminine physique. So that is Zahi Hawass's estimation of how to explain the look of the figures here. I'm just going to finish with this image. Uh, this is a tomb that was discovered in 1996 of Maya, Tutankhamun's wet nurse. And I finish with it for two reasons. One, to show that discoveries are continuing to be made and some very significant ones. 1996, I mean, it's a some time ago, but, but there are still th things to be found in Egypt today. And the second thing is, look at how extensive this tomb is of the wet nurse compared to the tomb of the Pharaoh himself, that simple little chamber. Uh, all the more evidence of the fact that Tutankhamun's tomb was not meant for a pharaoh of any standing at all. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this investigation of the Amarna period. It's a very interesting and enigmatic period of time in Egyptian history. And just a little blip within the history of Egypt, the very long history of Egypt, of course. 
in which things changed significantly, needless to say, but then went almost immediately back to the way they had been before to continue on for the next thousand years. And so a very interesting period of time that deserves further study.